All right. We are going to get started. We have a few seats left here. You are welcome to sit from the bar as well. Oh boy, welcome everybody back to the interval. It has been a very, very long time. Please give yourself a round of applause for actually showing up. Um, this is our first kind of real live talk uh, back here at the interval in, in a few years. And so thank you. And, and this has also been a talk that I've been talking with Creon about doing for a very, very long time. Um, and unfortunately, the problem of space debris has not gotten better since we started talking about this. Uh, but uh, it's one of the issues like asteroid impacts, like climate change, that um, that we all face as, as a civilization. And I think it's, it's one of those things that potentially we don't give the right due um, as, we, as we think on a civilizational scale. So I'm gonna start with a dramatized version of space debris uh, from the movie Gravity. And then, and then after that, Creon is gonna begin his talk. Here we go. Um, that was an exaggeration. Um, that was a, the Hollywood version of uh, Space Collisions and um, interesting movie Gravity. The entire movie takes place in the absence of gravity until the very last few seconds where she makes it safely back to Earth. Uh, anyway, um, that was supposed to be the destruction of the International Space Station due to an earlier collision that happens a few orbits previously. The wrench thing is a nod to a various objects that have been accidentally released in space. We'll be talking more about that. Um, this is more reality. This is, uh, I, okay, I worked at NASA for decades, and 
for the last few years, I spent a lot of time on the space debris problem. I'll talk about why shortly. This is uh, my hand, and this is an experiment that was run at the NASA Johnson Space Flight Center Space Debris Division's Hypervelocity Impact Facility. And what we see here is an aluminum plate that has been impacted at orbital velocities by a small steel BB. That is not the BB that impacted the plate and the plate was cut in half, but this is what can happen uh, at those velocities with collisions with even small objects. And um, uh, this is a slightly larger experiment. This is a satellite mock-up. Actually, if you know what that thing on the left is, it was highly classified for a long time, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is typical, you know, space, small space vehicle, maybe a meter in length, maybe a little longer. And this hypervelocity impact with a one centimeter marble-sized aluminum sphere moving at the relative velocity that your average space collision with orbit might happen. And on the right, the result fragments that they reassembled after the uh, collision with the one marble-sized object. So small, small objects can make a, a, a big mess and um, talk about probabilities and stuff later. I got drawn into this because I was asked in uh, what was the year again, 2009, I think it was. 2009, there was a big renewed interest in uh, the space debris and space collision avoidance problem, space traffic management problem, all sort of names of related problems. When the, uh, when a uh, Iridium satellite, which is a communication satellite, which there are many in orbit, collided with a uh, defunct uh, Russian Cosmos satellite, I forget what its purpose was, but uh, we don't really know what happened. In fact, the collision wasn't even predicted, interestingly enough, even with all the tracking of space objects that have been done. In 2009, they collided, and a big debris cloud was tracked. There's a whole radar network and optical network of things around the Earth tracking space objects. We don't have time to get into great detail on that. But as near as we can tell, this is probably what happened in the collision, was the um, Iridium just nicked this like boom that was sticking out of the cosmos. Cosmos is the left-hand one. And then this cloud of particles came about. This was a simulation done by Lawrence Livermore Labs trying to sort of retrodict what actually happened there. And this was thousands of fragments, thousands of trackable sized fragments. And of course, every one of these fragments can potentially then collide with something else and make more fragments. Now, this fortunately has been relatively rare. Uh, this got me into this, this topic and it's related to celestial mechanics and all kinds of other space things and so uh, I read a ton about it and orbit determination is part of it, tracking, uh, statistics, and then eventually ended up with some of my colleagues at NASA, some of who later went on to found Planet Labs where I currently work, uh, published a bunch of papers on this topic. This is just to say that I, I know something about it, I'm not one of the world's experts on this, but but uh, getting close. Uh, so, so um, you know, I worked on it for a couple of years, but not my whole career. Uh, so, the gravity gravity movie was was showing a dramatization of something happening at the International Space Station, and this is a big concern. Like, we really don't want anything even remotely like that. We don't even want anything to happen to the International Space Station. We don't even want a little tiny hole in it. Although, we'll talk more about that in a minute. It, it's truly an international project. In fact, one might argue that you know. One of the reasons the U.S. and Russia don't go to war is because there's U.S. and Russian astronauts up on the space station at all times. And it's sort of a, a soft power kind of detente diplomacy uh, stabilization process politically. Technologically, it's, it's an astonishing thing. It's, it's, it's probably the most expensive apparatus ever constructed. CERN, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, might, might also be up there. But... Um, it's enormous. Uh, you can't hardly even, I don't think you can see a, a human at this scale. It's about one football field in length. Uh, 
all the the solar arrays are big and impressive, but the whole rest of it is pretty much pressurized. Uh, it's got Japanese modules, European modules, U.S. modules, Russian modules. They're all interconnected. They're all interoperated. It's it's been uh, up there for 24 years. It took a few years to to get it fully built, and it's had at least seven people on it pretty much continuously for 24 years, rotating crews, international, and uh, over 250 astronauts from 19 different countries have um, been on board the ISS. Let's see, I think this next chart, it kind of, this also shows, like you can have, there. It, typically there are space vehicles from many different countries and many different companies docked at the International Space Station. And so it's uh, a hive of activity, ex experiments, and a lot of the time is spent just maintaining it. Um, but for anyone who thinks, you know, living on Mars is within our reach, let's just say living in, in low Earth orbit is, is very expensive and problematic, even on its own. Um, so there have been some debris strikes on the International Space Station that we know about. Uh, here's the Canadians have made big contributions to robotics on the space station. And so uh, unfortunately, one of their robots has been damaged by a debris strike. Again, this was probably only like maybe a few millimeters in size, the object that made that hole. We don't know. Uh, there's this beautiful thing on the International Space Station called the cupola, which is this sort of picture window dome thing where you can, it has no real purpose other than people looking through it and taking pictures through it and taking pictures of it. And they lie there and they look down at the earth in this panoramic view. And, uh, and it's a very beautiful thing. It's great that they made it. But what a lot of people don't know is on the outside of it, there are these shields that can be folded up, particularly when they know that there's a piece, a lot of times they will know that there's a piece of debris that's on the way, not necessarily to collide with the space station, but maybe to pass within a few kilometers of it, potentially. And so actually every time that they know that there's a substantial sized piece of debris, and by substantial, I mean anything we can track. And by anything we can track in low Earth orbit, I mean anything that's about five centimeters in size or bigger. So there's a lot of stuff that's smaller than that, which we'll talk about. But when they know that there's something five centimeters in size or bigger that is um, has a conjunction probability of more than, I don't know, one in 10,000 with the space station, they have to go, they have to close the, they don't have to go out. They close these shields and they actually get ready in the various human capable vehicles that are on the space station to evacuate if a catastrophe happens. Uh, here's some little tiny thing that hit one of the windows of the cupola, didn't break it, but you know, all kinds of things up there. Uh, this is a, a solar array uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope that was um, uh, retrieved after nine years in orbit and brought back to Earth. This is definitely debris strikes. I don't know the size of these solar cells we're looking at, they're probably at least like five by 10 centimeters, each of those things may be bigger. Uh, this is a, a selfie taken by the Sentinel-1 spacecraft, the European Space Agency radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar mission. And this uh, on the left is before and on the right is after um, a debris strike. Um, that bit is about uh, that show the red arrow is pointing to is about 40 centimeters in diameter. So this drawing on the chalkboard, also shown here, is from the original uh, paper in 1978 by Don Kessler and his associates. He was the man who essentially invented this field or started thinking about the problem of space debris. And he started thinking about it in the 70s and there had been no known space collisions at that time. And uh, he was just thinking, you know, what if we keep launching stuff into space and, you know, occasionally stuff blows up and occasionally pieces come off and there's going to be a probability that things could collide over time and create more pieces. And what might the cumulative number of collisions look like given different scenarios and simple models? And these are relatively simple models. You've got Newtonian 
dynamics of objects in orbit. That's been understood for a very long time. And then you've got collision probabilities, and you, know, you can make pretty good guesses about that. And uh, <clears throat> he made this graph showing predicted cumulative numbers of collisions based on different assumptions about how many or uh, how many objects were launched each year. Now, I should point out that it's now the 2020s, and we're launching many thousands of objects per year, not just a thousand or so, like is shown here. Um, so I went, and I, the NASA Johnson Center has a whole debris office with like dozens of people in it who study this professionally for their whole careers. And they publish a newsletter, I think, quarterly. And one of the things the newsletter has, in addition to research, is um, it has discussions about various events that happen in orbit. And some are called collisions. And that's where they're pretty sure, based on the tracking, that something collided. And other types of events are called fragmentations. And fragmentations, or particularly unknown fragmentations, fragmentations can happen for many reasons. Uh, Okay, yeah. So um, fragmentations can happen for many reasons. Uh, one reason something can explode, like a fuel tank can get weakened if it's not empty and it's still pressurized and it's in orbit for a long time in and out of the sun. It can just crack and fragment and explode. Batteries can explode. Um, Unexplained fragmentations could be collisions with objects that are too small to be tracked. And unexplained fragmentations could even be anti-satellite weapons, uh, possibly. So what I did was I took this original figure from this original paper by Kessler from 78, and I looked in all these reports from the Johnson Space Center talking at the different events that have happened, collision events, fragmentation events, and I overlaid the cumulative number of events on Kessler's graphs. So in the solid orange circles are the um, collisions, and each time there's a collision, the, it goes up one more count. And these hollow orange circles are the collisions plus the unexplained fragmentation events. So what we see rather interestingly, and the, the, uh, the upper right uh, hollow orange circle is literally off the chart. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit off the chart. And uh, what we see is that it's tracking his predictions rather well. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I should have maybe published this, but this is as far as I got. Um, and as I said, as I said, uh, JC, um, you know, here, here we just, in 2020, they cataloged uh, five breakup events. Um, I don't know if they classify them as collisions or just breakups, fragmentations. I think these might have been all fragmentations. And um, you can see some of these things that say satellite name are actually satellites, and some of them are, are third stages or tanks or cars and various large pieces of junk that are up there. Now, I should point out that the the rules have gotten a lot more draconian, both US rules and the and the UN rules. And like, it used to be that, you know, you could like have a lens cap go flying off of your telescope and nobody cared. And you could have, you know, explosive bolts and fragments everywhere when you were separating the rocket stage. And now all that stuff is, uh, not allowed at all, and all but the most pariah nation um, it, uh, abide by these conventions. Here's a sort of relatively, I think this is from the most recent issue of the Debris Journal. This is sort of totals of the objects. Um, Debris, the number of spacecraft, the number of debris objects, and the total objects by country. 
you can see that um, Russia and China lead in debris objects, 3,800 and 5,700 objects, respectively. I oh, know, I guess the US is up there too, 5,100 objects. Um, uh, anyway, you might expect the big spacefaring nations to have most of them. Um, and uh, when we say total objects in the lower right, 23,522, that's the number of objects that are tracked by the US Space Surveillance Network, which is approximately equal to the number that are cataloged in if you combine all the world's networks, because the US, as you might suspect, has been running and extending their network the longest. But the whole question of the World Space Surveillance Network versus the US Space Surveillance Network is, a, is another entire discussion, but it's it's a very interesting topic. All these radars all over the place and telescopes all over the place and how the data is brought together and who owns the data and how you harmonize the data and how different countries want to spin the data. Anyway, um, here's a graph that shows, this is again from JSC, it shows the it shows the total number of objects in space over uh, over the course of the space age, or since the dawn of the space age, and uh, they're classified by by different types, as you can see. The most important one is the total objects, because when you're thinking about collisions, that's kind of what matters. Um, and you'll see that there's those step functions in there, like the thing labeled one, and two, and three. And uh, <clears throat> one of those is the Iridium Cosmos collision. I mentioned that number one, the thing that kind of drew me and a bunch of other people in this field. And uh, it was not the first collision, we don't think, but it was the first one that produced a lot of debris. And uh, two and three were anti-satellite tests, respectively uh, Chinese and Russian. And as you may know, the US recently announced a unilateral uh, ban on anti-satellite weapons testing. Uh, some more cynical people might argue that we did enough of it in the 1970s and you know, don't need to do any more, but um, hopefully the rest of the world will, will follow suit because it's one of the most important things we could do both for world st stability and you know, also for the uh, keeping the orbital environment safer in terms of debris. Uh, remember I said there's, there's, we can track down to about five centimeters, but we have done experiments where we point high-powered radars, they're called beam park experiments, because you park the radar beam and you just point it at one spot. And as stuff go, goes in orbit, you get these radar reflections. So by taking a narrow, really high-power pencil radar beam and, and seeing what comes back, you can uh, get range and cross-section and get statistics on what's up there. You can't survey the whole sky this way, but you can kind of get the fluxes and make assumptions that they're uniform, perhaps. And what we see here, <clears throat> it's a log-log plot, but basically what this is, this is showing you, these are, are different experiments at different times. And uh, you can see that the number of objects of smaller size, which is the ones on the left, there's exponentially higher. I mean, if you go to 10 times smaller objects, there's like roughly 10 times as many objects. So it's a simple power law. And, um, and there are a thousand times as much flux of millimeter sized objects as there is of say, you know, larger objects. This is just saying that there's a lot of small stuff up there that we're not tracking. And that small stuff, as we saw from the beginning, could be kind of dangerous. Um, interestingly enough, these are not distributed equally in space. There are certain orbital altitudes that are much more congested. You can see up about 850 kilometers. Um, there's a lot of congestion. Uh, Starlink is getting more congested now. This graph is a little bit obsolete. At these lower altitudes, though, it's kind of lucky. One nice thing about really low altitudes, like down below 500, is that stuff just doesn't stay up very long. Atmospheric drag slows it down, and as it slows it down, the orbit gets even lower, and then the atmospheric drag gets 
even higher, it kind of gets exponentially higher as you go lower. And pretty soon when you're down at, um, you know, 400 kilometers, you don't have long to live, no matter, unless you're very dense and heavy, like if we took that uh, tungsten ball, you know, it might live a long time, but, but most satellites or debris is gonna live a very short time uh, at that altitude. So what do we, what can we do to reduce this problem and ensure that we can continue going into space and don't face like a debris minefield that's impassable full of satellites and nuts and bolts and other junk? Well, stop producing debris is the first thing. So I talked about the rules. There's a lot of detailed rules. You have to get all this stuff approved. If you're gonna launch a spacecraft, at least in most countries, uh, you have to show that you have a debris uh, remediation. I mean, you have to you have, you have to have go through a whole bunch of things to show that you're not going to be producing debris. That stuff's going to going to fall off your spacecraft. That stuff's not going to explode. Um, we have to stop doing anti-satellite weapons tests because, in a sense, they're like designed to produce debris, and um, it's probably not a good idea. Um, another thing we can do is, you know, we can just slow down launching stuff and wait and wait for the atmosphere to clean stuff out. And that, as I said, works at, at lower altitudes, but unfortunately at the higher altitudes, you know, a thousand kilometers and above, that stuff's going to be up there for hundreds or even thousands of years. And when you get up into like geo and the, the higher orbits, they're going to be there basically forever from our point of view, even from the long now's point of view, you know, like millions of years, right? Um, so I think this was, I'm going to see if this is a video. I can't remember. It is a video. So this is showing this atmospheric. Oh, that went very fast. All right, I guess we're going to skip that. There's this atmospheric cleaning effect. That video was supposed to show these things slowly getting caught and dragged down. It's kind of a technical thing. We don't need to do it. Um, the Another thing that helps us is uh, the solar cycle. So. The solar, the sun has like seven year cycle or 10 year cycle, depending on how you want to look at it. And it gets active and it gets inactive and it gets active and it gets inactive. And when it gets active, it, it puts out a lot more um, radiation at certain wavelengths. And they don't matter so much to us down here, hard to detect on the surface of the earth, but in the very upper atmosphere, uh, solar activity, particularly solar flares and stuff like that, which happen in this sort of cycle of seven or 14 years corresponding with sunspots and all that stuff th those solar uh, excursions make big changes in the extreme upper atmospheric density they can change the temperature of the upper atmosphere and hence the density they like they puff up the atmosphere of the earth i mean you wouldn't think of this as atmosphere it's like pretty much a vacuum but there's a small amount of gas up there and it gets way denser at Two, three, four, five hundred kilometers even above the surface of the Earth when the sun gets active, and that makes stuff get dragged down much faster because if there's more atmospheric density, it gets slowed down, and then it slows down more, and then it gets denser, lower atmosphere, and it burns up. And so there's this periodic cycle where, if you actually look at um, graphs, if you look at the checked debris, you can see that there's this kind of more and less, and more and less, more and less. That's because every seven years, more of it's getting dragged down. Oh, that's right. There, there, there you go. This is it. This is the solar cycle and the debris reentry is kind of superposed with each other. So when the sun is active, the red curve, more debris reenters. So that's, you know, there's some cleaning that's going on naturally, but, but not enough. Um, and this is kind of showing that that uh, cosmos satellite that I was talking about at the beginning, that collision, um, this, this just shows that, uh, for different size objects, you know, they're all decaying over time, but um, the larger ones take longer. That's interesting. The smaller ones, it's kind of just like sand blows in the wind more easily than big rocks. Um, so another thing we do is we restrict lifetime of satellite and Meaning, so we don't want a bunch of dead satellites up there. There are already too many, and we really don't want dead satellites up there. So what does that mean? Well, you can never ensure that a satellite won't die and just remain in orbit as a basically a big piece of junk. But what you can do is you can say, 
you have to dispose of it after a certain number of years if it's still alive. So you have to have an engine on it with enough propellant to take it and re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere, or at the very least, put it into an orbit that nobody cares about. So those are disposal options. Another thing you can do is just fly it very low to begin with, and then you know it's going to have a very short lifetime, even if it dies. That's what we do at Planet Labs mostly, is we build satellites, we launch them into relatively low orbits. They're only designed to last, say, five years, because after five years, the technology is presumably much better, and we don't really want them anymore, so we just have them at a low enough orbit that after about five years, they re-enter and burn up. But that's not always been the case. If you're building a billion-dollar satellite, you might want it to last a lot longer than five years. And therefore, you, you have to be very careful and have some way to dispose of it. And unfortunately, we'll get into this. The world's largest piece of space junk right now is a billion-dollar satellite called Envisat that the European Space, European space Agency sent up there. It's about the size of a school bus, and it died. And it's totally dead. I mean, it's and it just it's up there. And these very large dead objects are, in a sense, the biggest threat because if something collides with them, they can make a huge mess. Uh, so, wait, where was it? yeah. So, they, this is related to. There's a lot of proposals also for going up and getting stuff out of orbit. That's called active debris removal. And we'll talk a little bit about active debris removal, and then, and then we'll kind of summarize and then bring to an end. So um, yeah, active debris removal will be the next topic. Um, and then after active debris removal, we're going to talk about uh, space traffic management and collision avoidance, which are two aspects of the same thing. You know, given that there's a lot of stuff up there, and given that some of it is maneuverable and some of it is not, um, what can you do to avoid collisions? So, um, the first thing that you can avoid, you do to sort of avoid collisions, at least for active satellites, is have a traffic management system, kind of like we do with air traffic management. And you want to you want the satellites to, you want everybody to know where all the satellites are and you want everything in an orderly pattern so that collisions are very unlikely, kind of like the way we have, you know, streets with traffic signals and stuff like that. But satellites uh, have a different set of uh, geometries. And so this would be a typical distribution of satellites in a big constellation, like maybe Starlink or OneWeb or something like that. I mean, this is simplified, but a lot of satellites in a lot of different orbits. And it might look like a giant mess, and how could you uh, ever, how could you hope to not have a collision with a constellation this dense? But the, the issue is that if you look at it in three-dimensional geometry, you can see that there's ways to kind of thread stuff through each other. Um, you can imagine this thing sort of fully populated with these orange dots, like there could be thousands and thousands of them up there, and if they're all choreographed just right, they can sort of do a dance. I wish I had a video of this. Well, I will show some videos kind of like this of what it would be like. And one way to understand the dance is to map it out in, in other coordinate systems so that, you know, like instead of latitude and longitude on the Earth, you can kind of map it out in these grids and toruses where you're using different mathematical functions. And then they turn into these regular square patterns. And in a sense, every satellite is just sitting in a box. Now, when you put it back onto the three dimensions of the sphere of the Earth, uh, it doesn't look like a box so much anymore. So here's here's the Starlink constellation. And this is, we're mapping it out, not in latitude and longitude, or not in altitude and inclination, or any of the standard orbital elements. We're looking at um, two kind of derived orbital elements. We don't have to get into the technicalities of it, but they're just simple functions of the geometry. And what we see here is a bunch of Starlink satellites. And the ones that are in their assigned orbits are these pale gray dots. And then this, the brightly colored ones are the ones that have been recently launched. This was quite, from, quite some time ago. And now we're going to watch the evolution as they continue to launch them and continue to maneuver them into their positions. And um, there's a little music there. It doesn't matter. So the ones that have recently been launched are the ones that are moving. And once they get into their assigned positions, they turn, they turn gray. Each different launch is a different color. And you can see as they get gray, they just drop on this grid. And this, this means that even though they're all in orbit around the Earth, 
in this complicated dance in their own, in this special coordinate system they're just lying on a grid uh, the diamond shaped ones are defunct some of those defunct ones they're, they're really defunct like they have no control over them anymore um, but the point is that you can see these gray ones on the right slowing down and now they're locked into their position and now we're going to watch these blue the ones they slow down and they lock into their position and turn gray and see that really building up this grid and and then when you have this grid if everybody stays in their box once it's just a rigid grid and they're all up there and everybody stays in their little box there's not going to be any collisions in that constellation and so we could have boxes like that uh, globally you know for the entire world's satellites actually and we can have lots of satellites up there if everybody stays in their box and um, of course, this is complicated by the fact that you've got debris objects streaming through here who don't know about the boxes, right? But it's a start. So what do we do about these debris objects? So we can do active debris removal. And um, you know, everybody's got their favorite idea. Oh, we're going to build with a robot with claws, and it's going to grab stuff and then bring it back to Earth. Or we're going to like this is an actual uh, an actual satellite servicing mission but satellite servicing and debris removal are very similar you have to get into proximity of another satellite you have to grab grab it you have to attach to it and then you have to do something either refuel it or bring it or, or bring it back to the atmosphere so it can burn up or move it to some graveyard orbit now um this is a mission that actually took place uh a number of years ago a satellite servicing mission it was a tech, tech demo. It didn't actually service the satellite. It kind of released the thing and then went up to it and poked around that a little bit and then grabbed out a hold of it again. Um, but this is very similar to what you'd have to do if you were trying to bring a dead satellite uh, back. Now, the problem is oftentimes debris objects and dead objects, they're tumbling, it makes it harder to get, get a hold of them. So. Of course, people have said, oh, well, we'll just inflate like giant balloons and, you know, we'll like, we'll like somehow stick it to a balloon or, or, may, or everyone thinks they're very clever. Why don't you just send up a net, you know? And, um, and the, I mean, the thing to remember about this is these are objects in orbit. And if you do this, if you get something wrong, you end up just creating more debris. Like you can imagine this net gets tangled up and then, you know, now you've got an even worse problem, right? And now you've got, a, an even bigger thing flying around there or something accidentally it gets tangled up and it hits something else i mean these and also by the way all these kind of schemes like this they also are like sat anti-satellite weapons in disguise because i could just as well use this to go take your satellite and de and, and 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 remove it or or cover it up or turn it off as i could to get out of take a piece of space junk out of orbit uh you know if there's something something is tumbling you have to get you have to I don't know where people come up with these ideas, but I just collected as many as I could. Uh, you know, we're going to catch it with harpoons um, and then drag it away. Now, this is actually this is a this was a European space mission that got pretty far along planning phase called E. D. Orbit. This thing on the right is that school bus sized, gigantic Envisat dead uh, environmental satellite, and then the thing on the left was going it was fully all designed and ready to go well it wasn't built yet and it was going to grab the envy set which was not tumbling i don't believe and attach itself to the envy set and then just de-boost the whole thing down into the atmosphere and that got canceled unfortunately so that's envy set is still up there um they are actually this is going to launch in 2025 this is called clear space and um it is it is going to grab a, a spent, uh, is it a fregat upper stage? Uh, oh, someone will have to share the joke with me. Anyway, yeah, well, uh, right. Anyway, it's, it's the thing on the left is, is, is getting this medium sized piece of junk that's known to be up there. And um, uh, Europe is spending 86 million euros on this mission to bring back this one piece of junk. Uh, so here, so you can imagine a scenario where you remove the n largest pieces of junk from orbit every year. And so the question is, if you, since the largest pieces of junk are in a sense the biggest threat because they'll produce the most additional junk if they get impacted, you might say, well, what would this have? What effect would this have on overall growth of 
the debris population if we removed the n largest pieces from orbit. So since we have good information about much of what's up there and, um, and a lot of historical data, here we can see uh, various growth scenarios for space debris. This is assuming no additional anti-satellite weapons tests, okay? But this says, um, if you just do business as usual, you get the thick black line that's going on to the right, highest one. And that's just using like debris remediation techniques. And then if you use, um, if, you really, if you add in ADRO2, which is act debris removal of the two largest objects, the two most dangerous objects per year, uh, then you obviously see the dotted line, which is far less growth. And if you go to ADR5, that's the line that's almost flat going into the future. And that's if you remove the five worst offenders every year. So, and then those, the waviness of those lines is that solar cycle that I was talking about. So more stuff is going up there all the time, but more stuff is being cleaned out all the time. And you can balance it out. And then if you do a little active debris removal of just five objects per year, you can flatten this out. So that's kind of, that's pretty good news. Um, and, uh, okay, now we're going to get a little bit. So there's a Japanese anime series, which is all about space junk collectors, the space garbage men, and this is what they do. I understand it's very popular. I've only watched one episode. I think it's mostly about the relationships and the drama, but they happen to be um, <laughs> space garbage collectors. I mean... And again, if, uh, and then there's, okay, then everyone's like, well, why go up there with g g hooks and snares and nets and balloons? Why not send a giant laser up there and blast it and vaporize it? And it's like, yes, that was called <laughs> Star Wars. That was like, that's called space weapons. And that is arguably, I mean, if you have megawatt class lasers in space, oh, they're just up there to sell, you know, mitigate debris. This is going to be a hard sell. It's also, it's very hard to make a megawatt laser, even on the Earth. No one's come close, I think, to a megawatt continuous wave laser. And, um, and making it in space, probably too expensive and too dangerous. Ming the Merciless was the only one who was capable of building such lasers, as I understand it, ahead of his time, exactly. Um, and uh, that's the thing. These things are also weapons. Uh, so, it, But it turns out you can build... And in fact, Sandra may even actually have owned at one point in his life a multi-kilowatt class continuous wave laser. You can, you can get now 10 kilowatt class continuous wave lasers for machine shops. They're, these are the, the upper end of the uh, industrial lasers, but they're, they're, uh, they buy, they're, they're commonplace now. And so some colleagues and I at NASA came up with a thing we called light force, uh, which was a way to use relatively low power lasers to do space collision avoidance, not blast things out of the sky or vaporize them. But um, this is work that Will Marshall and I did um, back at NASA, and as well as a number of others whose names I shall mention later. And the idea was you use a ground-based laser hooked up to a moderate sized telescope shown here in the center. And you're let's say you're tracking a piece of debris that can't maneuver on its own. And you have a prediction that it's going to collide with another piece of debris that can't maneuver on its own. Now, these are the kind of, in a way, the worst problems because, first of all, there's arguably more debris than there is uh, non-debris up there. And the second is that debris in general, you know, debris can't maneuver. So there's no chance of somebody moving out of the way under their own power. So the question is, how do you prevent debris-debris collision, debris-debris collisions? And the idea is, if you shine this laser through this telescope on a piece of debris, you're not going to vaporize it or anything like that. You're going to put a little bit of what's called radiation pressure on it, the kind of thing that spins those little solar spinny things in those evacuated bulbs. Um, radiation pressure is a thing. It actually, you have to take the sun's radiation pressure into account when you're calculating the trajectory of a satellite in orbit. It's a slight perturbing force in addition to gravity and atmospheric drag. So radiation pressure is a thing, and it turns out that by using one of these industrial 10 kilowatt class lasers and a telescope of moderate aperture, like a university class telescope, like a one meter aperture telescope, using that laser and that telescope and some additional hardware, you can put enough light energy on a piece of debris that is equivalent to about 
what it would see in the sun, but you can put it either to slow it down in its orbit or to speed it up in its orbit if you point it in the right direction at the right time. And you can perturb the trajectory of that object. That's what's shown here on the upper right of this diagram is like the unperturbed trajectory without the laser engagement and the perturbed trajectory with the laser engagement. You only impart a few millimeters per second of delta V with each of these engagements, but it turns out a few millimeters per second over the course of a few hours or days amounts to a lot of distance that you can perturb the end uh, position of this object. And so you can actually uh, avoid collisions this way. And the question is, you know, how, 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 how well does this actually work? What do the numbers actually say? How much is it gonna cost? So we made the proposal, um, a whole bunch of organizations teamed up, uh, really great, great team. And we made a proposal and proposed it and um, to NASA when they were calling for proposals for uh, debris remediation and, and that sort of thing. Here's the picture of one of these lasers. It's about, I don't know how much these things cost, some fraction of a million dollars, I think, maybe less. That's about the size of a large fridge. Um, here's a one meter class telescope. That's also about a million bucks, maybe a little less. And here's the high power adaptive optics system. That's another thing you need for this. And then if you combine this stuff together, this is showing like one piece of debris. It'll make passes over this laser. And sometimes you'll be able to engage it for a short time. And sometimes you'll be able to engage it for a long time. And maybe since it's orbiting the Earth like roughly every 90 minutes, most stuff in Leo, or low Earth orbit is orbiting every 90 minutes, you would engage for maybe uh, 16 illuminations over the course of 24 hours. Some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. And you could end up perturbing the position of this object by engaging with the laser and just giving it a gentle little pushes. Uh, you could perturb enough that uh, down the line, you've, you've altered its, its trajectory by hundreds or even thousands of meters. That's shown here, the perturbed versus unperturbed trajectory. And this is with actual physics in the model, okay? And um, yeah. So you could build one of these stations for maybe, let's say, 10 million, and then it'd have to be automated, and you'd have to maybe, we figured you'd want to have like maybe 10 on the poles, near the poles, you know, where there's a lot of uh, overhead passes of most debris objects, because they're in orbits that take them near the poles most of the time. So for like $100 million, you could build this thing, which could, which could probably uh, drastically reduce the possibility of collisions for like 90% of the debris debris collisions in orbit. So for a hundred million dollars, so maybe, maybe it's even a little more than that. Just, this was not expensive enough for NASA, frankly. And, um, and they, they did something, I hate to be so cynical. But it's like some ways they just don't want to hear that you can solve a problem f for, you know, less than a billion dollars. And anyway, it turns out the, our Australian colleagues then actually went and kind of did this. They just demoed it. They had the laser, they had the telescope, and they they did some demo of this. So there was, I'm gonna skip the slide. So yeah, so the, this was, we did experiments at the Starfire uh, optical range. The Air Force did some experiments with us. They loved this idea. They love, they have the big laser that they shoot into space for reasons they won't talk about. And they're loving the idea that there was sort of an environmental beneficial reason to shoot these lasers into space. Uh, system diagram of the, of the thing we were proposing with the Australians. Here they are actually prototyping it on their optical bench. This is the high power adaptive optics thing. That's a technicality, but because of the atmosphere, you have to have some fancy corrective optics. And uh, there's the Australian facility, Mount Dromlo, wonderful people and they uh well oh, that's not very visible but that's that's a that is a picture from the instrument panel when they were engaging a debris object with a laser so this works i'm gonna last last thing i'm gonna talk about is um a, a debris remediation scheme by george darver from nasa ames this is brilliant he came up with this thing again it's probably not expensive enough but i mean it really makes sense okay and this is like it, let's say you have like one of those swarms like you saw in the movie, the gravity movie, where like there's like a thousand nuts and bolts and little things all come in, you know, because maybe something, maybe something fragmented and it's like a, it's sort of a jet. Anyway, it was like, how could you possibly move debris like that? Like you're not going to, you know, do that with harpoons, right? So 
his scheme is you launch a rocket, which is basically carrying a payload that just a big tank of, of, of liquid carbon dioxide. And I don't know if you ever played with liquid carbon dioxide in a tank, but what happens when you crack the tank? And when you launch this thing into a retrograde orbit, meaning the opposite orbit, if you have this cloud of different particles coming, you launch this tank of CO2 so that it's gonna intersect this cloud. And you make it, time it so that it's gonna intersect it on the night side of the Earth. And then, right just in time, the CO2 tank vents all of its CO2, which goes from liquid phase quickly to gas, and then it turns into crystals, dry ice crystals. It's on the night side of the Earth. So these dry ice crystals just sit there. Imagine like this long contrail of dry ice crystals that's been precision laid out so that the debris cloud is gonna pass right through it. And then the debris cloud, and then the, the rocket kind of re-enters itself using its own jets of CO2, leaves this debris cloud contrail right in the path of the oncoming debris. And the oncoming debris comes and it just gets ablated by this cloud of dry ice crystals. All the nuts and bolts and everything slowed down, burned up. And then what happens? 20 minutes later, the earth rotates and all this is in the day side and the crystals just sublime and instantly dissipate because they turn back into gas, which expands immediately. So I thought that's a brilliant scheme. Maybe we'll do that someday. Real practical ones. Um, so we've kind of gone through a bunch of this stuff. This is, I'm gonna end here. I'm just gonna mention in yellow here, there's like all kinds of other stuff to talk about. There's like the whole technical, regulatory, international. This is a, one of these problems that has so many moving parts, you know, socially, politically, economically. It's a coordination problem. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna end it there. Thanks very much. I think we're down to one mic, is that correct? Oh, two mics. We have two mics, which also means that I don't think we can pass one around. We'll just take questions and I'll repeat them as we have them. Um, so thank you. I, I want to. I really appreciate that you actually showed a hopeful view of space debris in this talk, which is very rare that we get to see. But I also want to like take a step back to the Kessler syndrome itself. So he predicted that um, that we were going to have this increasing curve of of material, um, but there was a, a syndrome that he talked about specifically about what was going to happen in that case that might change the way that humans interact with space. Can you just outline that a little bit further? Well, the idea, the idea is that if, there, if, if debris collisions produce more debris and produce more debris at a higher rate than it can be naturally removed or removed by humans, then you can end up with just a, an impassable cloud around the Earth, and you can just not be able to launch anything into space, maybe for thousands of years even and it would be like so ironic if starlink made if like if the guy who wants to make us a multi-planetary species ends up causing the kessler syndrome with his <laughs> this satellite constellation that would truly be ironic and and tragic but um uh i yeah so the kessler syndrome the idea that there's this runaway chain reaction and and it just becomes i don't want to say uninhabitable but but sort of on space becomes unusable at least in near Near it's so expensive to start removing things that it's kind of impossible for a long time. Yeah, or we'd have to have some new thinking. Right. And I also, the, I remember when you first uh, were working with Planet and you were telling me about the, you know, this, the expanding and contracting notion of um, the Earth's atmosphere that actually is a self cleaning notion was something that totally was new to me. Um, and is there a way that uh, companies like Planet and or some in Starlink, are they being required to do anything that puts, you know, be, forces them to put drag or forces them to be, have deorbiting capability? Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's new regs all the time now. We are not gonna be able to launch satellites without propulsion soon. And the main reason for the propulsion from the point of view of the regulatory agencies is collision avoidance and, de and end of life uh, disposal. 
you know, whether you want to use the propulsion for other purposes, you know, that's kind of up to you. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of new regulations, tracking, propulsion, um, stuff like that. And when I visited you guys in South America, this is actually a couple of your uh, places, your offices ago, but it was kind of stunning to me that after going to a NASA launch and then showing up at Planet, there was, you know, you were tracking at that time hundreds of satellites from one screen in South America, um, and then going to, you know, NASA where there are like hundreds of people tracking one thing. Um, but that, that kind of difference is happening in the, um, now that we have, uh, so many private efforts. How do they, how, you mentioned this coordination thing. How, how is the coordination happening both between international secret things of military and secret things and the private world? Um, yeah, that was a lot of stuff in there. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about first. Is this, there one database? How does, how does it work? Uh, there's, there's essentially one database. No, even that's complicated. Everybody knows. It's kind of like asking, is there one um, search engine? You know what I mean? Like, w there's several of them, and m most professionals know how to use multiple ones, and that's not a huge issue. Um, and there's ways to combine them to get higher accuracy, fusion, and all that stuff. I want to give some credit to NASA and these kind of places. Look, when I love Planet Labs, but when we have hundreds of when we have hundreds of satellites controlled by one person, these are like basically simple little webcams in space with some radios on board. When NASA has hundreds of people controlling something, it's like the space station or a Mars rover or something like this. It's like a whole other level of complexity and risk. I mean, one of our one of our satellites goes out is no huge deal. If if one of those Mars rovers goes out, it's like hundreds of careers and 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 you know billions of dollars. So. There's a reason that they, we do things differently. Uh, I have the highest respect for NASA in many ways, in spite of my snarky comments earlier. Um, okay, and then what was this about coordination? Like who's involved? Well, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I assume there's many secret objects in space. There's not, no, there's not many. Semi-secret objects that people don't want to talk about, but then if there's going to be a collision with a, like a, a, a defense agency thing, Versus a look. look private, let me let me say let me let me say something. Who that, gets the call? Uh, they both get the call. Everybody who's involved in a potential collision gets a call. Everyone who's involved in a conjunction, as they say, gets a call. I mean, if unless it's like a piece of debris of unknown origin, that's like who could possibly get the call in that case. But uh, I want to mention just one other thing that relates to this question: the, the secret objects is not such a big deal. Um, but the weird part is that some of the main technical and organizational infrastructure that is responsible for doing all the tracking is they kind of have, this is now the Space Force, it used to be called the Joint Space Operations Center. They have, it's now part of the Space Force, it's not the entire Space Force. They have these two conflicting goals. On the one hand, we are supposed to assure US space superiority in the military. And on the other hand, they're supposed to ensure safe, careful stewardship of the orbital environment. And the latter would have presumably uh, be something increased transparency would be in service of, but to ensure US space superiority, maybe increased transparency isn't the way to go. And the same agency has both missions, and so there's going to be some internal conflict there. And that's just one of the problems, you know. Uh, just thought I'd mention that. And do I assume other countries have their own parallel efforts that they share or do not share? They have efforts that they share and efforts that they do not share, indeed. <laughs> Thank you for that. And one of the things that I don't think we talked about, you kind of showed it at the beginning, but like, what are the what are the velocities? That we are talking about, like you showed average, the average average low Earth orbit collision velocity is uh, many kilometers per second uh, in miles so, per hour, uh, tens of thousands of miles. I mean, it's like ten times faster than a rifle bullet in general. So hyper velocity, like hypersonic. And 
you mentioned one of those unpredicted uh, collisions that happened with the uh, Canada arm. Um, how, and a few of those, like how many of those are we now seeing per year? Well, uh, again, to see it, we have to either have astronauts up there noticing that there's a hole or there was one before, or we have to see some event with a radar on Earth, and that means it's got to have big, big fragments. So we're only seeing right now as I said, uh, fragmentations like from zero to three or four a year, maybe five, in the, but we don't really know. This micro fragmentations could be happening more frequently. And we have a question from the internets, and we're going to grab some questions here from the audience next as well. Um, is there is there a current curve that's heading us towards a Kessler syndrome that if you if if left alone, where would we where would we be? Uh, if left alone, like if, if we stopped. Uh, I mean, stuff? you showed a curve that was going up, that we were hoping to flatten right. of space debris. At what point is that curve Kessler? Oh well, don't forget that curve. When I plotted those points on top of Kessler's thing, I mean, we were talking about over the course of many decades an aggregate of like twelve collisions. So we're not in like any sort of a horrible situation right now. Um, you'd have to extrapolate those curves much farther to have a real uh, impenetrable wall of space debris in orbit around the Earth. Uh, the curves which showed those growth scenarios that were actually coming from the NASA debris off show a more linear growth uh, scenario. Um, that's that's, I think, more like what's in our near future. And the question is, are we just going to let it get worse and worse, or are we going to flatten it out? It's not that much work to flatten it out. Uh, is it going to go nonlinear? It depends on your, kind of it depends on your time scale. Like almost, almost any curve is linear if you zoom in far enough. All right. Do we have any questions? Uh, short uh, questions. Charles. Let me repeat that just since we don't have a mic out there. So given what's up there right now, what are the chances of a big nasty collision? We've already had two that were maybe planned or were like the Chinese one and the Russian one, but something on the order of the gravity kind of collision. This is very hard because this is kind of one of these low probability, high impact events. Uh, it's like a Poisson process. So, you know, it, it's like, if I don't know how to answer that. The, the gravity thing was exaggerated and it, it wouldn't really go like that. But like, what's the probability of a big object smashing into the space station? That's very low because we know where the big objects are and we know where the space station is and we're gonna move the space station out of the way, okay? But, um, but that iridium cosmos collision that kind of drugged me into this, which produced thousands of fragments, many of which are re-entered by now. But um, yeah, I think we can expect to see every few years something like that, maybe bigger. It's a Poisson process, so sometimes a lot of them come and then there's a big gap. Fair enough. Other questions? Uh, Paul? I hear what you're saying. Could light force... Hold, hold on, let me just okay. recap this. Yeah, so the question is, could you use any of these systems, like the what the laser system you mentioned, um, effectively to push something into a correlated orbit? Um, and if it did happen, would anybody be able to detect that it was happening? I think the answer is it would be very hard, and you could detect it. And it doesn't really matter because... How would you even know if someone nudges debris or if it was just that was how it was headed? I mean, what I'm saying is that you'd see that there's a collision probability 
and it's getting worse as time goes on. And so you'd make a maneuver. And if you're just trying to make debris collide with other debris, that's just terrorism. That's the, like, you're not taking out anyone's asset there. You're just making a mess. Right. Other questions? In the back there. Yeah. Yes. Are, yeah. are the graphs including the particles that are too small to be tracked? Is that what you're asking? So they could have probabilities, but we're not tracking them. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Some of the graphs showed particles that are smaller than, than the ones that are tracked because we do know something about what's up there of even a very small size like like when that's one of the reason they brought back those panels from the hubble space telescope it's like well those things have been there for nine years and you know they're gonna have nine years worth of bombardment and then you can go look and see how many holes of a given size there are and you can at least know roughly the statistics of what's up there and how dangerous it is obviously you're not tracking every single sand grain or bb in orbit not yet you could make ours that build it that. but um so it's kind of a mixed bag. We know something about the statistics and distributions of the smaller objects and something about how dangerous they are, but we certainly don't know where everyone is at all times. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up and people, we're gonna stay here and people can ask more questions, but I wanna to kind of bring this back to that original kind of question of threat models that we all have to hold in our heads um, these days, um, is this question of, you know, where does this fit in your head in the world of something like climate change or an asteroid impact or some other kind of existential threat? Like, how do you put this into your... Yeah, well, okay. I'll end on a controversial note. Climate change is not an existential threat. It's not an existential to the threat to the planet or even to humans. It, it could be a serious... <laughs> problem that could set our civilization back maybe ir irrevocably back even i mean so could the kessler syndrome it could lock us here on earth there are similarities i mean and and, the, and neither is the kessler syndrome an existential threat like the worst it's going to do is you know keep us from going into space for a thousand years okay we would last a long time without ever going into space okay um but i'd like to an astro effects i don't that's too far that's too different. I think the, there's great similarities and great differences between the space debris problem and the climate problem. And I'd like to focus, uh, they both seem similar because they're like global environmental problems and it's a coordination problem because you have to try and get everybody to do something and it's gonna be very, it's gonna be somewhat expensive in the case of space debris and horrifically expensive in the case of uh, carbon emissions at least, that part of climate change to mitigate in the standard stupid ways that they want to mitigate it. <clears throat> I should be careful what I say, but, uh, but th 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 there are similar problems in this way. They are up in the sky, they're like involving the whole earth, but they're also very different problems, climate change and space debris. I mean, space debris is a simple problem. First of all, there's no question about are humans contributing to it or not, like, okay. <laughs> Um, secondly, and how much are they? There's no non-anthropogenic right, problem, here. right? Exactly. There's no. Right, it's all anthropogenic space debris, pretty much. And uh, then there's, um, and then there's the uh, the issue of like, how good are the models? Well, like, people argue about these climate models all the time. It's it's like so hard. I would I'd venture it's almost impossible. It's not my field, but it's like I've done fluidics and I've done chemistry. And I can tell you, we can't even do tiny little airplanes and simple molecules very accurate. And the idea we're going to model the whole planet with the sun and the magnetosphere and the biosphere and the oceans and make predictions down to a fraction of a degree Celsius over the course of decades, I find that preposterous. And, and contrast that with space debris, it's like Newtonian orbits and collision statistics. There's really no, not much to argue about, right? It's like the models are pretty simple. You can run them on a laptop. Well, I like coming out of here thinking that space debris is less of a problem that I went going in. So thank you for that.
Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I have a I have a gift for you here somewhere. There's a challenge coin, which I know you probably already have. Yeah, one. but I lost but, my challenge coin, perfect. which is like such right. a loser thing to do. So it's perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank um, you so much, Sandra. And if you guys could grab your glasses, leave your chairs, our staff will, and then just get out of the way. We'll move the chairs out of the way. But if you grab your glasses so they don't all break, that would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs>